Okay, welcome to LaSalle Studios. I've been uh, getting asked quite a bit to do a studio tour, so I uh, thought, why not? Uh, I am filming it right from my cell phone, though, so I'm not sure how good it's going to look or sound. Uh, for a studio tour, you'd think the audio should at least be good, but uh, anyways, uh, whatever. We'll see what happens with the cell phone. So as soon as you walk in, we have a bathroom right here. Oh, just bathroom, not too much to see. Uh, we have a very extensive... CD collection. Uh, I've always kind of collected music for quite a while, so it's all in one place now. And when my wife, uh, when my wife moved in here, we added her CDs in here too. So there's lots, uh, lots of variety up there. That's for sure. Okay, so uh, here we are. We got uh, two rooms in the studio. We got the control room. The live room. So let's uh, check out the live room first. Uh, as soon as you come in, <laughs> you notice the crazy green wall with the black checkers. Um, this is the kit that we use. It is a U-Drum kit, uh, custom made. U-Drum uh, is a Canadian company, actually right in Ontario, only a few hours away from us. So it's nice to go up there and uh, kind of hang out and see what uh, Paul's got going on there. Beautiful kit. Uh, it's actually my second one. I had a, another custom kit made before this, but uh, it was pretty one-dimensional sounding, very loud. Uh, there's vents on all the drums, so for recording, it's uh, not too handy. The sounds all bleed um, from mic to mic, so uh, there you go. Just turn the flashlight on. Maybe that'll help. Um, there we got a sub kick for miking the outside of the drum. <laughs> not made by U-Drum, but kind of thought... Why not put a sticker on there? Uh, we got a D112 microphone for miking the inside. Uh, Zildjian, A custom symbols. I got a set of Z, Z custom with my live U drum kit. Um, I find for recording these, I get a better sound out of. Um, so let's actually go behind the kit and check it out. So, yeah, that bass drum is long. It gives it a pretty cool sound, though. Uh, for the Tom mics, we got the Audix series mics. We got D2s on the Rack Tom. And the bottom mic for the snare is a D2. SM57 for the top of the snare. And uh, the Audix D4 for the floor tom. Uh, sounds good. Nice low end. Sorry about that. Got my uh, finger in the way. So let's drop, uh, the sounds pretty good. Love the sound of that snare. Nice pearl finish. And then it's, it really sparkles uh, in the light. So it's, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. And uh, this kick sounds great. DW 9000 uh, hardware and pedals, including the hi hat stand. So. Sounds good. Then over here we have uh, this is an old mixer that I used to use for uh, when my band was playing live more often, where we controlled uh, mixing samples to the PA as well as um, triggering samples for. Um, the front of the house monitors, we put our click track in there. I controlled in ear mixes. Uh, then there was actually a rack mounted CD, so you know, for intro music and whatnot for live. And then down there, I have a Bluetooth mouse and keyboard. Uh, so, what I do is when I record my own drums, I actually sit right here and I can use that uh, mouse and keyboard, which is Bluetooth to the uh, Mac Pro computer in the control room. And I have a very long maybe 75 foot VGA cable out to this TV here for a monitor for that other computer. So when I first started in here, I used to click record and come flying into the live room and try to run next to this kit. And, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it was a, it was a mess. So this, this, uh, this works better. And I find that I get better takes before I was like, ah, it's good enough, but, uh, that's not the way to do it. So it's a lot better now. And down there, it's actually a Joey Jordanson signature pearl snare, very tight sounding. Um, 
I guess that looks bad that it's kind of just a stand for that fan right now, but it it, it that's just so the snares on the bottom don't rattle. But uh, it does uh, sound very good. I mean, last thing we were using was that U drum snare. Um, so nice to have a few snare options. Uh, and then for miking, it's all run into this snake, which uh, goes through the wall into uh, the ceiling and then over to the control room so that uh, we're able to keep all the controls over there, all the settings, and then mic everything in here. Shut the door. Uh, it's a little more soundproof. We get a better sound. And uh, no bands or anybody making noise will uh, interfere with any of the recording. So got a few cabs. We got a Vox, 212s in there. This is a 1960A um, Marshall cab. There's 412s in there. We have... A small orange cab that came with the Tiny Terror, 112 in there. Got a Fender, Mustang cab. You can actually see the uh, speakers through the grill there. 412s. Um, this, these trainers are just a set of uh, PA speakers that we used to use uh, for jamming practice uh, before we played live. There's a Ampeg bass cab. Don't actually use it for recording too, too much. Uh, we DI through an Avalon Pre normally, but uh, this does give you a different sound, and it uh, it has been used, that's for sure. So, uh, oh, actually, in here we got a couple mics. We got a, another SM57. Great for miking guitar cabs. Um, down here. This is a, it's an AKG mic. Let me see if I can turn that around there. It, uh, you know, it sounds all right. I find that... Uh, I don't use it so much for recording guitar, but uh, it does a very good job of getting a room sound for when recording the drums. So that's primarily what it's in here for. And uh, back there, we just got a couple custom eight speakers. Uh, good for, you know, sometimes if I just want to jam along to something, I crank the music there and just play along for fun. And something else, we got a couple cameras here. One camera there. We got uh, another camera here. And uh, those are good because this TV, there's a camera in the other room where the drummer can see his band, you know, if I'm not using it as a monitor for the computer. And then these cameras on the TV in the other room, the band can see the drummer. Just the layout uh, wasn't able to have a nice window in the wall anywhere to uh, see through the control room to the live room. So that was our next best option. You know, I find it works well. It's kind of cool, different. Then in here is to the control room. So let's uh, check this out. So you first walked in. It's the computers, desk, all kinds of rack gear. I mean, we'll go through all that. Let's start over here. Uh, first thing you need, black leather couch. Every studio has one. Up here we got lots of guitars to choose from. Basses, electric guitars, lots of options. Uh, for the bass selection, this first one is um, was just my first bass. It's, it's not very good, um, <laughs> so we don't really use it for recording. But just because my first one, I just kept it. Uh, here we have a Fender Jag. Sounds excellent. Active pickups. Um, here we have a Fender Jazz Bass, which uh, sounds excellent. Uh, this finish... Um, when I got it, I thought, ooh, I've never saw this finish before. Very cool. And then it turns out once I kind of looked it up, I was like, oh, it's not quite as rare as I thought. I guess it's around quite a bit, but whatever. Sounds great. Uh, probably the bass we use most for recording here. These are two Les Pauls. The black one's got EMG pickups. This one's got P90s. So very good combo. Uh, layers, leads. Sounds awesome. Two Epiphones. Uh... These used to be my primary guitars. Now with these, these get used a lot less. <laughs> but, you know, they, um, for videos, whatnot, I mean, bringing her, they have, they have their uses. So here uh, is a DJ setup. I used to do some DJing. Um, it is all run off Serato. You can see the box back there. We got the Scratch Live vinyls. Very cool. Um, you know, if you haven't seen what it is, you should definitely look it up if you're interested in the whole DJ thing. Uh, basically, blank vinyls, and you can use any audio that you have loaded onto your computer, which is pretty neat. Uh, we got a Control X1 MIDI controller, four-channel mixer, um, 
you know, at first I was like, why would I need four channels? But uh, there are other uses. Once you, once you get DJing for a bit, uh, you know, the two for the tables, and then you kind of can run other sounds through the other two um, in between or after sets. Over here was a CDJ, kind of what got me started with it a little bit long, long time ago. Um, doesn't get used much anymore. You can probably tell by the the dust on that baby. This kind of whole section doesn't get used much. My old mixer, two channels. Um, just going to get rid of that. Old drum machine. I never use it now with MIDI controllers, so I don't know. Just the This area is going to be gone. Um, here is an Axiom 25. It's um, a MIDI controller. Much I have the 61, which is my primary MIDI controller. This is much smaller. Fits in a backpack with a MacBook. Awesome for any sort of remote recording. Um, then I have some... Oh, got a zebra chair. Uh, I got just some road cases there to have extra mics, cords, that sort of thing. You know, takes up space, but uh, you need the stuff. So over here... Actually, there's a couple PA speakers up there, too. They're uh, very big... Um, we use them just, you know, after a mix is done or if you want to come here and kind of jam live with the guitar and really crank the music, that's what those are used for. No monitoring, no mixing, <laughs> nothing like that, but, uh, they're cool up there for just, uh, really jamming music in here. So let's take a look at our, uh, different heads we use for recording guitars. We got the orange Tiny Terror, good little lamp, uh, for 7 watt, 15 watt options, and then, uh, Going down, we have the Ampeg uh, SVT450, uh, nice bass head, um, a bass friend of mine uh, has the 350 and recommended that I get it, uh, Lama Quaid only had the 450, I don't know the difference to be honest, but uh, they sound the same to me, I couldn't, you know, works well, we DI out of it to the Avalon once in a while, and um, and obviously for live, sounds amazing, down here, is a Vox. Uh, this is from the 60s. It is a sovereign head. Uh, very old solid state. Uh, cool. You know, Vox has all their controls in the back there, which are very hard to get to. And I use this amp very limited, so I put all of the controls on tape, kind of like a cheat sheet on the front, so I knew what I was doing. I looked uh, pretty smart just reaching back there, controlling <laughs> what I needed to without looking. Down here was my first Marshall head. It's just an MG100. First guitar head, nothing special. Um, don't really use it anymore, but uh, I don't know why. People would probably think it's uh, kind of stupid to hang on to all your first gear, but I think it's cool. I mean, I don't, haven't run out of space yet, but uh, we are going through an upgrade right now, so with the upgrade, some of this must stuff might have to find a new home, but uh, for now, it fits well in the rack. Um, Okay, we got a Mesa single rec. Sounds awesome. Heavier stuff. Uh, gets some really good tones. Uh, I've used that on lots and lots of tracks. Um, this is probably my primary head. It's a Marshall JCM 800 uh, 1981 series. It's got the actual toggles and not one of the reissues with the rocker switches. Um, a local guy, Jay Swatman, he fixes up guitars and amps and cabs and heads and everything and he knew i was in the market for one of these he tracked one down got it for me uh if you get the opportunity to buy one of these i would highly recommend it sounds amazing um here is a vox ac30 cc2 um there's not much to say about this amazing for clean tones i did the same thing with the controllers up there because they are also in the back hard to access Ooh, dusty under there too. Maybe I should do a little more cleaning. A few less videos, a little more cleaning. Um, so yeah, I'm sure a lot of people have heard the AC30. Sounds awesome. It's great for clean tones. Okay, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention. This GK unit. I found this on eBay. Before, I used to have just tons of cords just hanging here they all had tape with little labels on the end for each cab in the other room and i'd uh be plugging in patching in different head different cabs for uh different kind of combos or what uh what amp we wanted to use for which session so here this takes eight heads and eight cabs so i have all these heads plugged into here that's you were probably thinking like what well, is this guy stupid he doesn't even know what head this is he's got a label underneath this this is the number 
that's hooked up into here. So, you know, if I want to use the tiny tear, I just set it over to number seven. Obviously, doing this, be careful with the ohms. That's why I put it there. Just when I get something new, I remember it. And I usually do remember, but I write it there just in case. Be very careful when you're mixing, make sure, make, mixing cabs and heads. Make sure that matches. So you can run one cab, two cabs. And with that, you choose which cabs plugged in the other room. Have those, all the cabs labeled there for the numbers. So this is a very, very cool unit. It cleaned up the messy cords all hanging around, patching, made it a little more efficient. Uh, you know, I get guitar players here wanting that perfect tone. So having the two cab option, you can blend different sounds. Uh, works awesome. So, you know, I, I didn't even know this was a piece of gear that was out there. I just happened to find it on eBay one day and got it for a steal. So, love it. Uh, and then this is just a Furman power conditioner M8DX. You know, just power in the heads so those are good oh and then we got a couple more guitars on this wall we have a fender telly right there Ooh. missing a string yeah haven't replaced that yet no problem haven't used that actually in a couple tracks either that's been a while these two guitars don't really use this is one of my first guitars uh i think the only thing i've used it for in the studio was for a few guitar swings in a in a music video but uh didn't want to throw one of my les pauls down the street when we were recording so i was kind of new to the guitar swing at the time so i thought hey why not we'll throw this one down the street instead if it breaks off but got some strap locks on it all was good could have swung the les paul why not and uh this guitar right here it is a galaxy i actually got it from my grandpa it was pretty cool he's a an accordion player and he had this guitar i didn't know much about it and i looked it up this galaxy from what i could find uh it was a 1940s uh model i i mean i i don't know that's just some stuff i found on google i mean you know you trust everything you read on google right so i don't know if anybody does know anything about that please uh share it with me i'd like to know more about that guitar it uh you know, it actually surprisingly sounds half decent through that Sovereign head. Um, it's cool. I mean, those pickups, I don't know. <laughs> they, those aren't the EMGs, that's for sure. So here's an electric kit. Um, it's a Roland TD9. Um, I don't use it for any MIDI or actual tracking with drums anymore. The story behind this was when I lived at my parents' house, um, I used to play my drums a lot. And the loud kits were, it was just, a, it was a lot for inside the house. So I picked up this electric kit and, uh, you know, it's a little bigger than the standard one you'd pick up with the uh, four toms, snare, four, actually five cymbals, hi-hat, uh, double kick. I set it up and tried to set it up with the same layout that uh, my acoustic kit had so I could just jam at home and uh, wouldn't make too much noise inside the house for the parents and then... Uh, here is a Roland SPDS. I use that uh, with my live with my band. We put any sort of samples uh, from the studio that were on our album. We tried to replicate it live as closely as possible. So we'd put it in there, and uh, I could scroll through, you know, which song we were actually on, and it would come up with the name there. And each pad would have a different trigger for the sound. So it was very cool. Uh, a lot of people ask, like, "Oh, how are you getting that sound live?" So was neat now i've kind of just incorporated it with the electric kit um so yeah it not bad kind of cool to jam on once in a while i know when some guys come in here they think it's fun because it has a ton of sounds in that uh the roland td9 module so here we got an acoustic every studio's got an acoustic we don't uh record too too much acoustic stuff here uh, i was in a little acoustic project for a while which we did it that's on my channel but uh, other than that, you know, we do use it for writing, sorting things out, and just general jamming. <laughs> Over here, this is, uh, I guess, my most used pedals. Uh, on this side, we just have a chromatic tuner. Uh, gotta have one of those. Make sure you're in tune before you record anything. You don't want to record a whole song and realize you're out of tune. This is an Ibanez Tube Screener, Tube Screamer TS9 uh, for that overdrive sound. That is... Uh, what my go-to is and then this is just a boss noise suppressor ns2 um sometimes when you get some active pickups it's uh nice to put in the chain to kind of clear it up there's a few other pedal options i actually should just mention over here we do have a wah pedal yeah man, that's uh you need that for some things this was my first overdrive pedal it was kind of uh 
It is a TS9 clone. Does not sound like it. <laughs> it's the Behringer um, TO900 or something like that. It uh, it doesn't sound like it to kind of make it sound like it, it's going to, but um, it doesn't. This is the Metal Muff. This with the Mesa. Awesome tones. So what else we got here? Uh, let's take a look at the back of the mixer. Try to keep that looking clean. Doesn't. It's okay. Ooh, we got some picks from LaSalle Studios. Pretty cool. My uh, wife actually got me those for Christmas one year. She... It was a pretty cool surprise. Didn't even know you could really get that done, so it was awesome. She went and kind of took my logo off of... I'm trying to get to focus here. Took my logo off YouTube, sent it in, and got them made. It's awesome. A lot of people think that's pretty cool when they come in here. So what else have we got here? Let's uh, let's take a quick look at the keyboards. Uh, once I got into synthesizers, this is was the one I used mainly. It is the Roland SH-201. Uh, sounds good. There's lots of um, oscillating options on it and different uh, LFO options. And, and it, When you want to manipulate sounds, I've had very good luck with this. Uh, sounds good. And then I also use the Korg, um, well, the Micro Korg, and uh, also a <laughs> cool little synth. It's uh, very small. Uh, the keys on it, they're not weighted, so I found it pretty tough to play. Well, this is a little bit better. Um, with the MIDI stuff that I'm using now, I found it to be quite a bit better. Well, let's not say better. I don't want to say better because a lot of people, you know, use the synths and do very well. For me, I found it easier uh, with all the different sounds and triggering MIDI rather than uh, actually dialing in the sounds. It, it's more or less just different. Uh, sometimes it's cool to actually have your hands on the controllers to get the sound that you want and... <clears throat> Other times I'm able to get the sound I'm looking for through software, so it's kind of cool to be able to have both options. Then down here is just uh, lots of cords and adapters. Um, my wife organized that for me. Thank you very much. Uh, before I just had them in boxes, it was a disaster. It's not the kind of thing you want to have, but you have to. So nice to get them organized, cleaned up. So that was a big help. Got to have a nice, comfy leather chair for when you're recording, mixing. So let's take a look at the mixer. This is a Behringer MX-9000. You know, a lot of people, I guess Behringer kind of has a reputation for being lower-end gear. And, I mean, for what I use this for, it does, it does the job. Um, I am getting using less and less with a mixer for my recording. Right now, I pretty much only use the first 12 channels for the channel strips for all my drum mics. And then everything else is all the other gear in the studio if I just want to kind of monitor it live. But recording any of it, I DI right into the right into my DAW. And then over here, uh, yeah, the buses I actually use for my monitor control. I do have a set of M-Audio monitors, my KRKs. This is my headphone preamp and the K8s in the other room. And these are the big 15 inch PA speakers in here so I mean maybe this is a little bit overkill for but with the upgrade we're going through right now I am looking at getting a personas control station so that would be nice to kind of put all my monitoring controls into a single rack unit so let's take a look at some of the outboard gear we have here uh, right off the bat this thing it's a tuner uh, it's nice. You can never have too many tuners in the studio. Make sure you're in tune always. And then uh, here, lots of times I'm trying to figure out the tempo of a track for setting it in the in Logic. I have to tap out the tempo. Um, you'd be surprised how many bands come in and don't know what tempo their songs are. So, yep, that's about that's all that is. That's all we use that for. Here is the Avalon Di that I keep talking about. It is the Avalon U5. Uh, it is excellent. Its primary role here is for recording bass guitars. Do use it anytime, I guess, we need um, DIing into our system. So that would be for keys, anything else. Um, and then the other half, uh, which, it, you know, you buy this separately. This is the Avalon M5 Pre. Uh, sounds excellent. Very, very clean Pre. And um, we do a lot of, currently, vocal editing through the Waves Bundle plugins. So I found that 
I've been most successful getting a very clean signal going in so I could do my editing in the box. Um, <clears throat> at the time, that's kind of all I could afford when we were setting that up. But through our conversion now, I am looking to get a little bit more outboard gear and um, hoping to get a few more colored preamps. And uh, right now we're looking at some APIs for the drums, um, some Neve 1073s. Uh, you know, I... <laughs> More pre sounds, the the better as far as I'm concerned. But th those are the primary ones we're looking at right now. Uh, my first pre was uh, this Focusrite Voice Master Pro. Um, I use it less now that we do have the Avalon, but it does have its use. Uh, so we do use it once in a while. It has onboard EQ compressor, deesser. Um, so that's nice to have all in a single tra channel strip form. Uh, these pre's we use a lot for guitars. Um, they're made by Golden Age, and they are the pre-73 Mark IIs. Uh, it's supposed to be a Neve 1073 clone. I mean, the price is like one-tenth of uh, Neve. Maybe more, I, I, you know, I don't even know. But I paid, I paid a little under 500 bucks for each of these. And uh, for the price, they sound great. If you're trying to get the Neve 1073 sound... This does not get you to where you want to be. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of it. So it, um, I've used the 1073s. They sound awesome. It's uh, one, why it's one of the most sought after uh, preamps. But uh, this is a great uh, sound uh, for the budget. Um, yeah, I mean, it is what it is, and I've used them on lots of tracks and had good success with them. Uh, here is our headphone preamp. It's just a Behringer four-channel unit. Um, the first channel uh, goes out to the vocal booth. Second channel goes to the drum... Actually, second and third channel goes to the drum room. And fourth channel uh, is if we want another set of headphones inside the control room. Lots of times bass players, you know, instead of listening through the monitor, they want to kind of get in the zone, get in their headphones. We use that one. Then we have um, a Patch Bay TRS made by Nutrick. It is a 24 channel. I mean, it's very handy, so I can get all this stuff wired in through the back and patch it in as needed from the front. And then here, it's just there was an empty rack space, so I just put uh, a blank plate and labeled what uh, goes where. Then we have a power conditioner made by Monster Pro 900, just to power this rack. Excellent. Uh, this is a Rain GE60 Graphic EQ. I don't use it too much in the studio. Well, I guess I should say I don't use it at all in the studio. That's why it's at the bottom of the rack. But uh, I used to do live sound for a concert venue in town. Um, it has closed down now, but I use this a lot for live um, live sound, and it sounded really good. So, you know, I kind of popped it in the rack here. Didn't really want to get rid of it. It is a good EQ, but... Uh, have different options for in the studio. Here is the interface that we currently use. It is a Tascam US1641. So 16 inputs, uh, more than enough for all my drums, guitars, without having to patch in too much different stuff. I kind of have the first um, 10 set for drums all the time, the next two or three set for guitar, and I run vocals at the end. It uh, It is good, but we are going through an upgrade, as I said. Um, the interface that we have ordered is an Apogee Symphony, so uh, that'll be very nice to upgrade from this US1641. And then one other thing I actually skipped over is this Alesis 3630 compressor. It is a dual channel. It uh, was the first compressor I bought, has done very well, but along in the upgrade we are looking, well, not looking, we are getting an LA-2A, so it... Uh, don't think I'm going to be using that Alesis too much after that, but uh, you know, right now that is what we are using. Here is the primary computer that we use in the studio. It is a 2009 Mac Pro. It has um, oh, it has what is it? 16 gigs of RAM, which we've recently upgraded to 32 gigs of RAM. It is eight core. It's the 2.1 model with 3 gigahertz. It was the server edition when it came out. So what we actually did do, uh, we were able to upgrade it to uh, El Capitan, the 10.11 OS X, which was required to get the Logic Pro X update. So I didn't know if that was going to work. It did, and it's been running very stable ever since. It's got uh, 
four internal hard drives, the boot drive that runs Logic and the DAW is uh, solid state. And that, if I can recommend something to make your computer run faster when you're running lots of plugins, it was a solid state. It did much more than the RAM I found. And then there's three other internal drives that I was talking about, each one two terabytes. So got uh, Time Machine set up in there and then um, for working projects and archive projects. So lots of memory. And uh, up here, this is a secondary computer. Let me just uh, log in here. So this is not actually running anything for the studio. Uh, I use it so that we can keep the Mac Pro for studio recording use only and any other sort of stuff that I do, um, I do on this computer. So it uh, it kind of has all of our family stuff on there, pictures, iTunes library, any uh, internet stuff, kind of all of our all, all of our documents. We run a cloud in our house, uh, basically uh, a NAS system and it's all stored on there. So very good to keep the primary recording machine I find off the internet <clears throat> and just use it solely for recording and I haven't had any issues with that so far. Um, so I am very happy with sticking to that idea and uh, let's just go over here we'll take a look. With the two computers we do have dual keyboard. It's kind of weird at first to kind of get used to make sure you're using the right one. Uh, the one for the Mac Pro I did get the the sticker overlays for the keyboard that has all the shortcuts. Um, it's for Logic Pro 9, but a lot of shortcuts are the same. And I tried to take them off, and they come off like a huge mess, so they're staying on. Um, actually, let's take a look at the primary recording computer here. Oh, I've got to punch in my password. Okay, so this is... Um, the primary recording thing, let's just open Logic just so we can see, that's the DAW that we use here, um, I know I said that a few times, uh, for mixing, we have the Mackie Control Universal Pro, um, it is very nice and speeds up your workflow with mixing, and I know a lot of people are more than happy with mixing right in Logic, but uh, yeah, the automated faders, you saw that. When you open a project, wherever the mixer settings last were, it automatically moves these to there. So that's that's pretty neat. And uh, the C4 I use for controlling all the plugins with the mixers. It has sped up my workflow. And uh, again, like I said, I like to use the hardware controls in my mouse as least as possible. Um, so let's take a look what else we got here uh, before we go up to the actual computer part of it um right here we have oh, we have LaSalle Studios coasters here <laughs> kind of different so I, actually these desks I should mention my grandfather who gave me the guitar also made these desks for me I kind of gave him all the measurements of the room and the racks and everything I wanted to do and he made them so it's uh it's actually pretty cool and uh I had him sign them he made these tables over here as well kind of Dated and signed them. I thought that was uh, pretty neat. So, 05 was the mixing tables for the DJ, which is quite a while ago. And uh, right here, been using this desk since 2010. So it's kind of cool that he made those. Uh, did a very good job. It's awesome. He can kind of build anything. I wish I was a little more like that. Um, so here we have the American DJ. Um, PC 100 days. These were designed to control lighting. Uh, that's what it was explained to me, but I found that they're very useful. With all this outboard gear, a lot of them don't have power switches on the front to turn on, on and off, so you can kind of leave them plugged in and control the on and off right from there, so that's kind of neat. And uh, another Monster Pro 900 uh, power conditioner for the monitors, This uh, the Control Pros, the 11 rack, which uh, we're going to now. So here's the Ele Avid 11 rack. You know, a lot of people debate whether this sounds good for recording, for live, for anything compared to um, tube heads, solid state heads. And to be honest, if I have the option, I will use 
my Mesa and JCM 800 um, anytime I can. But within the past year, we did just have a baby. So quiet or silent recording sometimes <laughs> has to happen. And I found this to be the best option for me. I know it. Um, there's an editor piece of software that works very well with Pro Tools, which I do have Pro Tools. Uh, but my primary DAW is Logic Pro X. So, um, yeah, I mean... I've been able to get some very good sounds out of this and uh, have no complaints. It's just uh, something different. So here is a recent project that I was working on. So typically, Monitor 1, I have my arrange window where we do all of our editing, um, kind of keep it organized. This window, we have a mixer. This was just a vocal cover. Uh, we didn't make the instrumental or anything on this one, so very limited tracks, but uh, very cool. Um, then up here is the other TV that I was talking about. We we're doing vocal editing, so I have uh, just some plugins up there so I can watch how they're functioning with the voice. So actually that's a 1073 clone and a LA-2A clone from the Waves bundle, which uh, like I said, it works well with the Avalon Pre. Um, looking forward to getting both those pieces of gear in uh, hardware form, so very cool. Uh, so this TV actually is, like I said, those the um, Cameras in the other room when there's bands behind me uh, sitting on this couch here, they can kind of see their drummer playing, which, you know, it's kind of cool. Or then I also, uh, if it's just me in here, I will put uh, sometimes the Wings games, Tigers, you know, got to keep an eye on my teams, see how they're doing. So that's good. Um, over here, we can take a look at our monitors. Uh, I used to have a set of NS10s, and I don't know why I thought, huh, I want to try something different. And I went to these KRK6s. And boy, do I wish I had my NS10s back. But um, these do sound good. Um, they are different, and it was something I had to get used to. But uh, what I typically use these for now um, is while we're actually tracking. So we can listen to the guitar live while we're tracking, listen to the stuff that's recorded in the DAW. Uh, small set of M audios don't sound too good, but uh, it kind of gives you a better idea of what maybe laptop speakers or headphones, something like that might sound like. Uh, so if you can mix, get the mix to sound good on those, uh, anything after that usually sounds very good. Uh, I got a set of Beats up there. Um, don't use those for mixing. I've never really been able to master that. I know some guys do very well, but... Um, I just kind of keep them in the studio um, in here. I got an iPad, uh, PS3, you know, bands sometimes. That's also hooked up to the TV. Bands get bored. So distracting their <laughs> their buddies, try to get them to play a video game and, you know, kind of when they get bored, something to do. Got business cards. Kind of cool. Down here we got an old school Xbox DVD player. So this is just, um, it's made by Tech Pro. It's it's just a DB monitor, this. It, um, it was kind of cool f for live. Uh, don't really use it now. Th this is a MIDI controller. This is a Alesis Trigger I.O. I'll show you, I'll, once we go down this rack a little more, I'll show you my original MIDI setup, and that's what this was used for, uh, for mapping and controlling that. This is just a wireless mic. Uh, again, keep going back to the live performances. That's what it was used for. Here's a Digitech Vocalist 2. Um, which was also used for live, uh, haven't used it yet for recording. Furman M8DX power conditioner for this rack. And then here we have a MIDI controller, which is the Akai APC40, and I primarily use it with Ableton. Uh, you can see the lights on there. It is on. Um, I use it for with Ableton, with Reason. Uh, it's awesome if you're going to be using it to make beats. Uh, this this is my newer MIDI controller. Before this, I was using... Oh, this drawer stuck. It's not even hooked up. <laughs> so this is the Korg pad control. A uh, few less options, but this was my original uh, MIDI controller. I, I don't know why. I just like the, the size of the pads on this better and uh, the feel of them. So it's, it is... Um, they are sensitive. So it is, it is a nice feel. Um, here's another mixer that I used to use for live, which this solely controlled our in-ear mix, and um, that was about it. So in the studio, I mean, just filling up rack space, I guess. So this is the original MIDI setup that I was talking about. It's an ESI 4000. This thing is old. 
it loads all of its MIDI sounds off of a floppy disk. So I don't even have a computer that takes floppy disk anymore, so I can't even put sounds on it. But I kind of thought it was cool um, to kind of have and uh, keep in the studio because uh, you don't really see that kind of stuff anymore. Here is something else we use live. It's the, made by Antares. It's the AVP-1. So this is a vocal processor, which also runs auto-tune live. Um, it gives you actual pitch correction, or you can use it for that chromatic effect. Uh, we triggered it with a foot switch. was kind of neat. Uh, a lot of people were surprised when they found out we used that. Uh, down here, just we got chargers, cords, adapters, just phones, iPads more business cards. Um, down here we got some mics. We got some SM58s. These I used for hi-hat, ride, SM57. Um, some moon gels for the drums. Some old DIs. Uh, okay, so then over here, the vocal booth. Basically, this is basically used to be an old uh, bedroom, so this would have been the walk-in closet in the bedroom that we've converted into the vocal booth, which is kind of uh, cool. So let me just see in here. So it is all dark. It's black in here, you know. A lot, a lot of people seem to like it darker in there, you know. Sometimes vocal sessions can get quite lengthy, so. Uh, we got notepad here, guys writing stuff down, remembering things, you know. Lots of old projects in here. Um, we got a set of Sennheiser HD 280 Pros. They're uh, they are good for again not mixing or anything, but just uh, using live uh, or not live. Sorry, while listening to playback while you're recording. For though we have the same set in the drum drum room as well. Here is the vocal mic. Let me move that there. It is the Apex 480. At the time when I was setting the studio up, this was kind of the best mic that I could afford. Um, you know, it gets the job done, and I've learned a few tricks to get the most out of this mic. Uh, with the upgrade, we are looking at getting a U87, which would be awesome, and I'm looking forward to that. But uh, for now, this is what we have, and we get uh, quite a uh, quite a good sound out of it. So, pop filter. Yeah, cool. So this is the vocal booth. And there's also a camera up there as well, you can see. Uh, so on the TV, the singer thinks he's uh, in this black private room here, and uh, but really we can see what he's doing. So, And behind me, on the door, I painted it black. And uh, anybody who records here, I do get them to sign the door, which has been uh, it's kind of, been kind of cool. Uh, I think I've missed a few people, but uh, yeah, there's lots of people have signed it uh, over over the time uh yeah so there's don't be take forever to name everybody but um yeah i thought this was kind of cool uh artists usually i think it's pretty neat after a project's done to kind of come in here and sign the door so yeah anyways this video is kind of getting lengthy and i know Nobody wants to sit through this long of just listening to somebody talk, but uh, have got asked for this video, so I thought, why not? Might as well do it. So, anyways, this is kind of just again an overview of the room. And uh, I'm planning on doing another one of these videos once the upgrade is complete and uh, kind of see where we're at then. So, anyways, thanks for watching. Click like, subscribe, and. Uh, Check out the new music that's coming from the South Studios. Thank you. Bye-bye.